лекция профессора Беркмана и будет, видимо, сфокусирована вот на э, оценках с точки зрения Кембриджского университета современного статуса Арктики и современного состояния международно-правых норм, которые применены к Северному Ледовитому океану. I think it's a proper time to say a few words in English so that Professor Berkan could hear me and understand how I am introducing him before you. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce you uh, Professor Berkman from Cambridge University. Uh, Professor Berkman works in Cambridge University for quite a long period of time already. He is an author of a number of publications devoted specifically to political and legal aspects of activities in international space, Could you help me get my such as the Arctic, Antarctic, high seas, etc. Uh, we shall benefit from his experience as a director of a Cambridge University scientific research program on geopolitics in the Arctic Ocean. And that is very important position, I can assure you. Also, Professor Bergman and me, we were co-chairmen of a number of international conferences specifically devoted to uh, political and legal aspects of uh, uh, environmental security in the Arctic Ocean. And that is also very important. And now Professor Bergman is preparing as an <coughs> editor, and I happen to be co-editor of a book, which is a result of this international conference, which took place, uh, I believe, one year ago. Um, yeah. in London. Professor Beckman. Thank you very much, Professor Vilijanin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, kind colleagues. Um, <coughs> please interrupt me. Ask questions. Um, my intention is to uh, share ideas with you. So I'm interested in learning from you as much as you're interested in learning from me. So hopefully that's a lot, because I'm interested in learning from you. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is diminishing sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And the word diminishing is a term that's been used in a number of reports in the United States in terms of what's happening to the sea ice. So uh, it is shrinking, uh, both in lateral extent and in thickness. So it is diminishing. And what I'd like to share with you are ideas, observations, about what is happening in terms of newly navigable waters, waters that can be now uh, used for shipping, for oil and gas, for fisheries, for tourism, in ways that have not been possible in the past. Um, the figure that you see here uh, is, in a sense, the world we live in. And so what I will share with you about the Arctic is relevant to virtually any region on Earth, or for that matter, in space. So at the center of it, in this perspective, is the Arctic Ocean, but it could be anywhere else. And in a sense, the objective is to identify who the audience is that is involved with this region. So in the case of the Arctic Ocean, the first ring of influence are the Arctic coastal states. And I'll show you who they are in a moment. The Arctic coastal states would include Russia and Denmark and Norway, Canada, Iceland, United States. Beyond the <coughs> coastal states are non-coastal Arctic states, which would include Finland and Sweden. Within the Arctic coastal states and non-coastal states, there are indigenous peoples that have lived in the Arctic, but they're not states. 
they don't have the rights and responsibilities under international law that nation states have. <coughs> Beyond the Arctic states, are non-Arctic states. And beyond the non-Arctic states is global civil society, largely speaking. So you can see that in this figure, everybody's included. Now, the interest that these groups have in the Arctic depends on where they sit, but everybody's included. And this is important in terms of how we develop strategies. Now, you are all involved in international relations or international law, is that correct? Yeah. So, part of the challenge that we face, not you, not me, but we face, is understanding how to balance the interests of many different types of stakeholders. And one way of doing that is to consider strategies that are inclusive. So once you begin drawing boundaries and saying this group belongs in the room and that one belongs out of the room, then you create opposition. And so part of the challenge is figuring out how to create strategies that bring groups together, that create productive, forward-looking, meaningful strategies for the future. So the bottom line of this slide simply is that the Arctic represents more than the Arctic. It is a situation that involves the entire world today and forever into the future. So I'd like to try and take a, a civilization perspective. We live at a very special time in the history of our civilization. So I want you to think of where you sit as a generation in the relationship to every generation that has ever come before us and every generation that will ever come after us. We sit at a very important time in the history of our civilization. In a sense, our civilization has been written by the interaction of nation states. Nation states on Earth, the boundaries of nation states cover 30% of the Earth's surface. So if we think of the Earth as a planet, a planet within the solar system, about 30% of the Earth's surface falls within the boundaries of nations. And those 30% are defined in terms of national interests. That means that 70% of the Earth falls beyond the boundaries of nations. And since World War II, those regions have been collectively defined by international law, international institutions, as international spaces. So if we think about it, think of the Earth as a planet 70% of the Earth falls beyond the boundaries of nations. That's an enormous responsibility. This has only happened in the last 50 years, effectively your generation, our generation. So in a sense, what we have today and forever after is a dichotomy between national interests, which count for 30% of the Earth's surface, and common interests, which account for 70% of the Earth's surface. And so what I'd like to explore with you today is how to achieve this balance. You're involved with international relations. We are involved with international relations. The responsibility we collectively share is one of perspective. How do we, as individuals, contribute thoughtful options to the various decision makers that exist around the world so that we can create hope and inspiration for future generations. So I'm going to talk about the Arctic, but often in thinking about the Arctic immediately comes to mind the Antarctic. So we're talking about the polar region of the Earth. And I thought it might be useful just to 
briefly go over the difference and similarities between the two polar regions. Now both polar regions exist at the geographic <coughs> 90 degrees south or 90 degrees north. So they're both polar regions on opposite ends of the Earth. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents. The Antarctic is a continent surrounded by oceans. Both have ecosystems that are strongly influenced by the solar cycle. So north and south of the Arctic or Antarctic Circle, it's 24 hours of daylight and 24 hours of darkness. So that light day cycle influences the dynamics of plants and plants get consumed by animals and so on. So in effect, the ecosystems are strongly influenced by their polar latitudes. In the past, the Arctic has been defined in terms of year-round sea ice. Sea ice that turns out to be multi-year sea ice. Sea ice that could be as thick as this room on top of the ocean. In the Antarctic, the sea ice retreats and expands annually from 20 million square kilometers down to about 3 million square kilometers. So there's a huge fluctuation in sea ice. And one of the things that I'll show you in a moment is related to the sea ice in the Arctic. And that's the fundamental change that's happening because of this world we live in. The Arctic has the broadest and shallowest continental shelf, and it turns out that the most, uh, most of the Arctic continental shelf falls within the Russian Arctic. Whereas the Antarctic has the narrowest and deepest continental shelf. So there are some very significant contrasts in terms of the ocean itself. In the Antarctic, there's never been any indigenous people, whereas there have been indigenous people living in the Arctic for millennia. In fact, at the last glacial maximum about 17,000 years ago, across a region that is now the Bering Strait, it was possible for people to walk between what is today Russia and the United States across that land bridge because sea level was about 130 meters lower than it is today. In the Arctic, there are recognized territorial jurisdictions. In the Antarctic, there are claims to sovereignty. And this is an enormous difference in terms of the geopolitics of the two regions. One has claims to sovereignty, one has recognized territorial jurisdiction. In the Antarctic, access is unrestricted. You can go anywhere, anywhere on the continent at any time without permission. In the Arctic, access is restricted because we have sovereign jurisdictions. In the Antarctic, we have living resources and activities, same in the Arctic. Mineral resources in the Arctic has been ongoing and certainly expanding, as I will show you. Uh, and in the Antarctic, it has been effectively prohibited. Ecotourism is extensive in both regions. Military presence has been extensive in the Arctic since World War II and effectively prohibited in the Antarctic. Nuclear weapons, the Antarctic is the first, Antarctic Treaty is the first nuclear arms agreement in the world. 1959 Antarctic Treaty, first nuclear arms agreement in the world. No nuclear weapons in the Antarctic, but in the Arctic, nuclear weapons has been extensive. Common interests, and which is what I will share with you, has been in the terms of sustainable development and environmental protection in the Arctic and a host of activities in the Antarctic in terms of peaceful purposes, living resources, inspection, conservation, preservation. The two legal frameworks, and this is where much of the Arctic becomes problematic in terms of whenever the word Antarctic is mentioned, is the Antarctic is based on a treaty, the Antarctic Treaty. In the Arctic, the discussion, the scope is falls within the law of the sea in particular, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So, what areas of, of international law are you interested in, in this room? Just out of curiosity. Anybody want to share what they're interested in? <coughs> I have to pull it out of you, see? Otherwise, I would stand on a desk and, and look down at you, but it's easier to stand behind the table. So, any observations of what you're interested in in international law? I don't bite, you can answer. <laughs> 
I, I think you mostly speak English, so you're understanding what I say. <laughs> Observations? What, what, what are you curious about in the world? What tickles your fancy? Yes, please. Um, international organizations, artists, OK. OK. So those are all relevant to the Arctic. Questions of territory, keeping the world peaceful, all relevant to the Arctic. Okay? Other observations, and I hope I address some of those in the talk. Other observations. What are you interested in? What, what tickles your fancy? Why are you studying international relations or international law? It's okay. You can, we can talk. It's, it's, it's possible. Yes? I think international treaties is a very interesting subject for learning. Okay, international treaties, and certainly how they interact with each other. Yeah. Okay, the notion of institutional. Yes, please. Uh, this solution between states and. Between states, exactly. Okay, certainly the relationships of states is fundamental. And, we ha and an important thing to recognize in terms of thinking about how states interact is the leaders of nations. The leaders of nations always can use good ideas. So where those good ideas originate is anywhere from anyone. So good ideas and how states interact can come from you. They don't have to come from, they don't magically appear out of the presidents and prime ministers of nations. Those good ideas originate from individuals, and those individuals are people like yourselves. So do not be intimidated just because individuals sit in very important offices. In your careers, it is important to recognize that you can contribute thought leadership, and those thoughts and that leadership can influence the way nations interact. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Arctic Ocean. So I've given you the contrast between the Arctic and the Antarctic. I mentioned that the Arctic, in terms of a region, can be objectively defined as north of the Arctic Circle. So the Arctic Circle is a place on the planet. It's a physical location. It's independent of any geopolitical boundaries. And geopolitical boundaries are very subjective. They're based on what a nation or nations agree to. But if we think about it in terms of how to create solutions, at every point we want objectivity. We want something that's constant, something that's not going to change over time. The boundaries of nations, as we know, change. However, a, geopolitical, a boundary based on the Earth's surface, based on its relationship to the sun, is constant. So we can talk about the Arctic Circle, for example, today, or 200 years from now, it will still be the same. So when we think of projecting strategies into the future, one important aspect is consistency. Solutions that are the same today and tomorrow and 100 years from now. So these are important. How do we create strategies that are reliable, that are consistent? that are objective. And one way is to base them on features of systems that are not going to change. And so in case of the Arctic, the way that I work with the Arctic is north and south of the Arctic Circle, 65.5 degrees. Now, the Arctic Circle um, is a point on the Earth. So if you were to think of the Earth, um, there's a pole or a line going from the North Pole to the South Pole. However, that axis of the Earth is tilted. It's tilted 23 and a half degrees off of vertical. So that tilt, if you have 90 degrees at the North Pole, 23 and a half degrees off of vertical is 66 and a half degrees. And so that's the reason 66 and a half degrees is the polar circle. Now, in terms of thinking about it, just very basic observations. If the Earth axis was tilted, it had no tilt, we would have the same season at every latitude, 365 days of the year. It's because of the Earth's tilt that we have seasons. And if you think of seasons, 
what we experience during our lifetime, and you project that over hundreds of years and millennia, that's what happens. It's the seasons and the Earth's tilt are all related, <coughs> and these are accentuated over longer periods. <coughs> so I mentioned the Arctic states, USA, the United States, Canada, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, <coughs> and Russia are coastal states. With the exception of Iceland, the coastal states have been communicating with each other. And so one of the challenges in the Arctic itself is that among the Arctic coastal states, Iceland has been excluded. So from the perspective of Iceland, they're not very happy about that. Because they're a coastal state, they're clearly involved with the Arctic Ocean, but they're not being treated as a coastal state. The other states in the Arctic are Finland and Sweden, and then we have the indigenous peoples that are circumpolar. The Arctic Ocean itself is connected to the North Atlantic and to the North Pacific. And so one of the opportunities is to consider transit from the North Atlantic to the North Pacific. Now, a lot of you may have heard about what's going on with the sea ice in the Arctic. How many of you have heard things about the sea ice in the Arctic? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, well then, gosh, I, I assume things. Um, for about 800,000 years, 800 millennia, the Arctic Ocean has had a sea ice cover 365 days a year. It has been projected that during the 21st century, this century, somewhere in the middle of this century, the Arctic Ocean will be open water during the middle of the summer. That's a phenomenon that hasn't occurred in 800,000 years. So if you think about it in terms of the generation that we live in, this world that we live in, your, your generation, your children's generation, during this time period of this century, the Arctic is going through an environmental state change from a permanent sea ice cap to a seasonally <coughs> ice-free sea. This is a phenomenon that hasn't occurred in the Arctic for at least the last 800,000 years. That's a long time. And it's happening today. Now, this perspective about the Arctic being open water during the summer has changed the way nations interact because suddenly they're seeing all kinds of opportunities. And they're projecting somewhere out in the middle of the 21st century. So this is, is uh, 1900, this is 2100. And somewhere in the middle of the 21st century, about 2040, it's projected that the Arctic will be open water during the summer. And nations have begun to think about this. Organizations like the International Maritime Organization are projecting increased shipping in the Arctic in relation to these models. And we see continuously decreasing sea ice extent. So that upper figure is a, is a chart from satellites. Again, objective measurements of just showing what the extent of sea ice is in the Arctic. And you can see that it's decreasing. So the projection is somewhere in the middle of the 21st century. Well, I'm going to share with you that it's happened already. It's not something that's decades into the future. The situation has already changed in the Arctic today. The purple area is, the purple on this graph is first year sea ice. That's ice that grows on the Arctic Ocean during the winter, melts during the summer, and regrows during the summer again, during the winter. The blue, the light blue, is one to two year old ice, and the green is multi year ice, greater than two year old ice. Historically, so this is 1981 here, and this is 2010 right here. Historically, the sea ice in the Arctic has been multi year sea ice. So the system itself has been characterized by multi year sea ice. In 2010, right here, the purple, the amount of first year sea ice exceeded 50% of the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. So in effect, today, 
the majority of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean is first year sea ice. The system already has flipped in terms of its basic ice cover. The majority of the Arctic Ocean today is first year sea ice. Now the consequences of this are significant. The upper graph shows you September 2010. So that's during the middle of the summer. The one on the left shows you March 2010. And you can see in March, which is the middle of the winter, from the Bering Strait to the Barents Sea, all the way across from left to right, Barents Sea, Bering Strait to the Barents Sea, is first year sea ice. That region is the northern sea route. That is the Russian Arctic. So today, 2011, it is possible to travel across the Arctic Ocean in ice strengthened ship, not ice breakers, but ice strengthened ships all year round. So the issue is not something that's projected to the middle of the 21st century. It is something that will, could happen today. I was at, in a meeting in, in Korea in uh, October of last year. I went to the largest shipyard in the world, uh, owned by a company called Hyundai. Hyundai has a shipyard that, with cranes that can lift 2,000 tons, pieces of metal, straight off the ground. Big cranes, and they have these assembly lines where 2,000 ton pieces are brought off the ground and cooked to the next minute and welded together. And this company, Hyundai, builds 80 ships a year. These ships are 50 to 100,000 tons. These ships cost on the order of 500 million to $2 billion. We're talking significant amount of investment, significant amount of activity. 80 ships, each costing a billion dollars. That's an enormous amount of, of ex economic activity. Hyundai wants to double their capacity. That means they want to sell 160 ships a year rather than 80. We have difficult economic circumstances in the world. If a company like Hyundai wants to extend their ship sales, double it, the only way they can do that is by identifying new markets. And one new market that exists in the world today is the Arctic. The Arctic as a trade route or trade routes. The only reason Hyundai and other companies haven't begun manufacturing ships for the Arctic at the rate that they're talking about is simply a matter of economics. At this point, it's not economics that they can do it or that there are companies that could buy the ships. The economics are price differentials between Europe and Asia. If Europe and Asia could actually define those commodities that were relatively expensive in, in Asia and cheap in Europe and vice versa, then you would have a justification for ongoing trade that would be directly through the Arctic. Spot prices between commodities. And so at this point, there is no economic driver. They recognize that the Arctic is 40% shorter trade route than going through the Suez or Panama Canal, so there's certainly justification for going through that region. But to build the ships and to have that turn on as a significant trade route requires some economic push. And that would be associated with commodities and spot prices between Europe and Asia. So in thinking about international relations, there are a host of things that are important to recognize. It's not just the treaties. It's a combination of the physical environment, the treaties that exist, the international relations, the laws that are developed. <coughs> the economics of the situation. They all play into this discussion. So I mentioned the trade routes. Certainly the most significant trade activity, trade route potential exists along the Russian Arctic through the Northern Sea Route, the blue. Uh, the Russia, Russian uh, Federation will be the most significant beneficiary economically from this environmental state change in the Arctic without question, both in terms of shipping, because the first regions to be accessible are already along the northern sea route. The ice is progressively moving toward Canada. 
Canada will be the last region in terms of the beneficiary of this ice change. In addition, Russia has the largest and broadest uh, continental shelf with significant oil deposits. The other possibility at some later point will be center of the Arctic Ocean, in which case they're no longer going through the nation's economic zones, exclusive economic zones or territorial seas, but they're going through the high seas. And I'll show you what those regions are. So the zones in the ocean will influence the types of activities. And eventually, at some point, they'll be able to transit across the Canadian Arctic and the United States as well with Greenland. The other feature that is important to think about in terms of the Arctic is certainly oil and gas. And for comparison, I mentioned the Antarctic is uh, different in many ways, but there are lessons that we can learn from the Antarctic that are relevant to the Arctic. And understanding these lessons is helpful because it gives us insights about what will likely happen in the future. So in 1974, in the Antarctic, the U.S. Geologic Survey had a ship down there, and they, this ship drilled holes in the seafloor and suggested that there was somewhere on the order of 45 billion barrels of oil and 115 <coughs> trillion cubic feet of natural gas in 1974. In 1973, there was the OPEC oil embargo, and suddenly, in the United States, gasoline, a, a, a gallon of gas went from 23 cents to a dollar. And there were long get lines at the gas stations to fill up the cars. And ever since then, gas has never returned to that price. Ever since that point in time, gas, price of gas has just continued to go up. Oil that we purchase for cars and so on. Fuels, energy, has become increasingly more expensive. So in the 1970s, suddenly they were suggesting that there were vast amounts of oil and gas in the continental shelf of the Antarctic. They were, the numbers they were using at the time were 25% of global oil and gas was going to be found on the Antarctic continental shelf. Well, you can imagine, suddenly the entire world is saying, there's oil and gas in the Antarctic continental shelf. Energy is, a, is precious in the world we live in. We all want it. The Antarctic is in an international space, therefore, we all want to be part of the Antarctic. Well, now we're in 2009, and the United States Geologic Survey again published a paper suggested that about 30% of the undiscovered gas and 13% of the world's undiscovered oil, about, 100, about 618 billion barrels of oil, same order of magnitude as in the Antarctic, with a high probability of more than 770 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, same order of magnitude as in the Antarctic, are found on the continental shelf of the Arctic. Well, you can imagine, same thing, same level of interest suddenly is emerging around the world. Everybody wants to play in the Arctic. Vast amounts of oil and gas, energy is expensive and precious to nations and their operations. Everybody wants to play in the Arctic. Well, what can we learn from the Antarctic? Well, if we look at the nations and how they interacted with each other, in 1959, 12 nations created the Antarctic Treaty. And those nations were happily going along as the Antarctic Treaty nations. Well, if we think about the Arctic, we've got eight Arctic states, and they're happily going along as the Arctic states. Suddenly, in 1973-74, was the OPEC oil embargo and this drilling in the Ross Sea. And suddenly, international interest changed. And over the next 15 years, the Antarctic Treaty Parties were forced to accommodate the interests of the international community. What was at risk was the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty was built on the concept of common interests for mankind, quote unquote. It was built on peaceful purposes. It was built on a strategy of equitability for everybody. So if the Antarctic Treaty nations excluded the rest of the world, in effect, they undermined the Antarctic Treaty. So the Antarctic Treaty parties were faced with a dilemma. Either accommodate the interests of the international community 
or invalidate the Antarctic Treaty. And so over the next 15 years, the Antarctic Treaty parties brought new nations in to the Antarctic Treaty system. And you can see that it grew about 300% in terms of the participation in the Antarctic Treaty from about 1974 to 1991. In 1991, the Antarctic Treaty parties, at that point all of the nations, agreed to a protocol on environmental protection to the Antarctic Treaty. And that protocol in one article, Article 7, simply stated there shall be no mineral resource activities in the Antarctic with the exception of scientific purposes. So in 1991, mineral resources were effectively taken off the table, and at that point, interest in the Antarctic Treaty leveled off. And so this profile that you see in front of you is not unusual. It occurs with a number of other international institutions. At some point, there's an establishment phase where nations begin to interact with each other. Then there's some type of trigger, something that forces nations that interest to grow internationally. And there's an accommodation phase. And then with, with a bit of optimism, the last phase I've referred to as global stewardship. Well, if we look at the Arctic today, the Arctic is right at that transition between the establishment phase and the accommodation phase. The world is looking in at the Arctic. It's not just the backyard of the Arctic states. The entire world is interested in the Arctic. Among the institutions is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the UN Convention transits from the nation state into the international space in both the water column and on the sea floor. The, inter the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is perhaps the most significant treaty that we have ever created as a, as a civilization. It, accom it, accomplishes, it encompasses the entire ocean of the Earth. That's a significant amount of space. It ranges from the territorial sea and contiguous zone through the exclusive economic zone, 200 miles off the coast, and then beyond that is the high seas. That is a region that is in the water column. <coughs> On the sea floor, we have the continental shelf, and there's various ways it's defined in the Law of the Sea Convention. And then beyond the continental shelf is the deep sea. So the deep sea and the high seas are explicitly beyond sovereign jurisdictions. So when we talk about 70% of the earth, most of the earth falls within the high seas. Most of the Earth's surface falls within the high seas. And the sea floor, the, the deep sea, has potential. And we don't know what the resources are. So this is the Law of the Sea Convention. What does it mean with regard to the Arctic? Well, the common perspective of the Arctic is that the Arctic coastal states are carving up the Arctic. That they're defining the entire Arctic as related to the five coastal states, Russia, Norway, Denmark, Canada, and the United States. However, those perspectives are perspectives of the sea floor. The sea floor may or may not, depending on the uh, decisions of the uh, Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, under the UN Convention, Article 76, for those that are aficionados, um, may or may not extend all the way to the North Pole. So let's say for discussion purposes, the entire seafloor of the Arctic Ocean falls within the nation state's jurisdictions. Independent of any decisions about the seafloor, there will still be high seas in the center of the Arctic Ocean. So the seafloor, whatever happens to the seafloor, there will still be high seas beyond the exclusive economic zones in the Arctic. And so in that figure you see the dark blue. The dark blue are the high seas, and the light blue surrounding it is the exclusive economic zones. So in perpetuity, there will be high seas in the center of the Arctic Ocean. So the Arctic states are faced with a dilemma. Either work 
with the international community or the international community will recognize that the high seas, they already have rights and responsibilities in the high seas. So in a sense, the law of the sea provides a framework for balancing national interests and common interests. And as I've showed you on the perspective of the earth, this is a challenge we face as a civilization. So the decisions and solutions we make for the Arctic will have precedent about how we proceed as a civilization the rest of the earth. Now, you probably can't read all of this, but I'm just going to show you a number of organizations. Since there's institutions like the Law of the Sea Convention, there's a number of other organizations. The first one I've listed is the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is a high-level forum and probably the most significant Arctic body. There's the Forum of Arctic Research Operators, the International Arctic Science Committee, and all of these that are being highlighted include all of the Arctic states, both the coastal and the non-coastal states. The North Atlantic Coast Guard Forum, the Search and Rescue Agreement that was signed in May of this year, the Standing Committee on Arctic Parliamentarians, and the Spitsbergen Treaty. The bottom of the Spitsbergen Treaty, you see that there are 42. That 42 represents the number of nations that have signed the Spitsbergen Treaty from 1920 alone. So while there are eight Arctic states, there is long-standing interest of the international community in the, in the Arctic, best represented by the Spitsbergen Treaty, which includes countries like Afghanistan and Argentina, Chile and Egypt and so on. If we come up with, if we work together as a group of nations, questions about what type of infrastructure can be implemented in the Arctic. And again, it comes back to the challenge of consistency. How do we create solutions that are objective that are shared by all nations, that are open and accessible. This is a profile, so fair is fair. You're all working on degrees. This is produced by my students, so cross the pond student activity. This is produced by my student as part of his doctoral dissertation. This is the first profile of shipping across the Arctic Ocean for every day in a, in a year. And in 2009, a report was published called the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment. That data was collected in 2004. It was shared by various countries and published in 2009. But if we're going to make decisions about rescuing a ship today or setting up infrastructure to accommodate shipping across the Arctic, we can't wait five years. The information has to come in real-time manner. And this is the first profile to actually show what happens in the Arctic Ocean every day for an entire can calendar year. And it ended in April of 2010. This is taken by satellites. So the satellites are looking down in the Arctic Ocean. They provide completely objective view of the Arctic. The ships themselves are using what is called autom automatic identification system information. They're transmitting coordinates up to the satellites satellites receiving them and transmitting it back to a, a station. And what we see here, this, these red areas are an accumulation of dots. Each dot is an individual ship. The white area is the extent of sea ice. And what we see from this profile is today, in 2010-2011, there is shipping throughout the year in ice-covered areas today. So the notion of shipping 365 days a year, the notion of companies like Hyundai operating in the Arctic, all of that is happening today. It's not something that's 20 or 30 years into the future. This type of information will require coordination among a number of space agencies. So the Russian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, Canadian, Japanese, Chinese, 
All of these space agencies will have to coordinate their activities in order to provide this type of infrastructure going forward. This right now is collected by a private company. And so among the activities I'm involved with is I am an expert for the European Space Agency. And before I worked at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in California uh, with NASA. So satellites give us a perspective of the Arctic that is 365 days a year and full Arctic coverage. Information that is accessible, transparent, by all parties simultaneously. So somebody mentioned the word <coughs> peace. Um, for the Arctic, uh, one speech that I highly recommend that you read is from 1987 by President Mikhail Gorbachev in Murmansk. It is referred as Gorbachev's speech or the Murmansk speech. But that speech in 1987 effectively set the stage for everything that has happened in the Arctic going forward. <coughs> in that speech, Gorbachev spoke of an Arctic Research Council. That became the Arctic Council. He spoke of environmental protection. He spoke of shipping. All of those things have come to be. It was a very visionary speech. Now, you as, as students of, of, of international relations and certainly living in Russia may have better insights being able to read the text in Russian. I had to read a translation. But the circumstances of that speech at the end of the Cold War certainly were important because in a sense what that speech did, it suggested that an important feature of the Arctic was cooperation. And that speech opened the door for a new level of cooperation among the Arctic states. And in that speech, Gorbachev spoke of the concept of let the North Pole be a pole of peace. For background, I was at a meeting last year in Moscow, uh, in September as well, at the inf inf invitation of the Russian Geographic Society. I'm going to a meeting, same meeting uh, tomorrow in Archangel. Uh, and Vladimir Putin spoke at the meeting last year. And what was re remarkable, as, from my perspective, again, not being able to understand the Russian, but a translation, was that Prime Minister Putin was speaking in terms of peace. He was speaking in terms of cooperation. He was speaking in terms of investment, scientific research, collaboration in the Arctic. And my insight at the moment, at that time, was that, in effect, the cooperation that began in the late 1980s, early 1990s, as the Cold War was ending, that level of cooperation has matured. That trust among nations has matured. And that the level of cooperation is significant and strong enough today where nations can begin to consider the more difficult questions. Peace itself is a difficult question because peace is fundamental in one way or another to the stability of any nation. And security questions ultimately relate to stability or risks of instability. So when Gorbachev spoke of let the North Pole be a pole of peace as a concept, <coughs> peace itself has yet to be identified as a common Arctic interest. It has not yet been identified as a common Arctic interest. So if we think about peace, the word peace itself is you know, a biblical term. It's a, it's a term that sits on trees and you know, floats <coughs> through the air. And you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated term. But if we think about peace in practical terms, how do we achieve peace? How do we maintain peace? I would suggest that there are two components. One component of achieving peace and maintaining peace is to promote cooperation. And I would call these two sides of a coin. So as a coin, one side a coin doesn't make. It has two sides. So one side of the coin of peace 
is to promote cooperation. Oops. The other side of the coin is to prevent conflict. The two sides of the coin go together. Preventing cooperate, promoting cooperation and preventing conflict are not the same thing, but they're clearly related to each other. By preventing co uh, conflict, you're promoting cooperation, and by promoting cooperation, you're preventing conflict. But they're different types of considerations. Preventing conflict explicitly involves those things that conflict, whatever they happen to be, whether it's economic institutions, military institutions, social institutions, whatever they happen to be. But preventing conflict is important. And the challenge today we face in the Arctic is not one of tension. Actually, tensions are very low. Countries like Norway and Russia have signed an agreement in the Barents Sea that settled a 40-year dispute. That agreement came into force in 2011. The Law of the Sea Convention is operating. The eight Arctic states just signed a search and rescue agreement in May of this year. Their tensions are low. So for those that would suggest that by even talking about conflict, you're raising the bar and creating a situation that doesn't exist, I would suggest that, in effect, the absence of considering how to prevent conflict is complacency. And the biggest risk in the Arctic is one of complacency. So in a sense, the challenge we face is how to promote stability. How do we promote cooperation and prevent conflict? And so at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that on a global scale, we had regions that were defined in terms of national interest, 30% of the Earth, and 70% of the Earth as regions beyond national interest or international spaces. In effect, we had national interests and common interests. I would suggest that the strategy that we have as a civilization going forward in terms of stability, in terms of peace, will be achieved by balancing national interests and common interests. And so the solutions that we develop as a civilization for the Arctic will have long-term precedence as to how we achieve stability and peace on a global scale for the future. Thank you very much. So where did, yes please. Yes. Only two years from 2007 to 2008, nine. Let's see, backwards. How can we possibly use a short period of time? This I'm one? Sure that the is correct. This is my assistant. Everybody give me a hand. So I'd like to go back to that first one to answer this gentleman's question. Maybe we can just exit from this. There we go. This one. Thank you. Uh, uh, good. Yep. Uh, no. Anyway, this is the figure. Okay. So we'll work this. Okay. We'll work with this. Um, so your question, please rephrase your question. Uh, how can it be possible that only a period of two years there is a 20 or 30 percent decrease of the sludge in the layer of ice? Not the, uh, so the, what happens is the, the, uh, it's not just a matter of the atmosphere melting the surface of the ocean or melting. It's a combination of the North Atlantic coming into the Arctic and the amount of fresh water coming in from the Pacific. It's a matter of the circulation of the atmosphere. It's a matter of the surface heating from the atmosphere. All of that combines. In addition, the influence of the ice itself is uh, the ice reflects sunlight. And when the ice decreases, the amount of sunlight that's reflected, 
decreases. So the system itself warms because of that. So in effect, as the sea ice decreases, there's a positive feedback which accelerates the process. And so it just turns out at that point, the amount of sea ice ex exceeded 50%, or the first year sea ice exceeded for 50%. And that was because the area of open water exceeded 50%. So there's, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at numbers, various flavors, there's different ways of interpreting it, half full, half empty, you know, glasses and so on. In the case of the Arctic, the common perspective has been to think of the Arctic in terms of its lateral extent how much area the sea ice covers. However, the rate of change of sea ice is much faster in the vertical. So the, the ice is changing, is thinning faster than it's decreasing in the, in the lateral extent. And it's that vertical component, it's the ice thickness that ultimately right now is the more important feature of the ice system in the Arctic. And so the perspective has been the lateral extent because that's something we see from satellites. However, the thickness turns out to be a more important driver of the change in the sea ice extent. And so that's the reason it has rapidly decreased in that. In that. Does that answer your question? Other questions, please? In a row, yes, please. Um, the Arctic states, um, as a group, in unison, in Alulasat in 2008, said there will be no new treaty, period, end of statement, no new treaty. Um, and at the same time, in the Alulasat declaration, they said the law of the sea is the appropriate framework. And in effect, the law of the sea is the appropriate framework because we're talking about an ocean surrounded by continents, whereas the Antarctic Treaty is a continent surrounded by oceans. There are a number of other differences about the Arctic that don't exist in the Antarctic. In particular, as I showed you in that, that one slide, in particular, the Arctic has defined territories that belong to nations, sovereign jurisdictions. In the Antarctic, there were only claims to sovereignty. And Russia and United States in particular never exercised their rights to make a claim. So in effect, the, the big differences between the Antarctic and the Arctic have to do with the physical system. One's a continent surrounded by ocean. The other one's an ocean surrounded by continent. But the, but the differences are geopolitical differences, differences that the Arctic has sovereign jurisdictions, recognized sovereign jurisdictions. The Arctic has also been extensively militarized. And so one of the challenges we face in the Arctic is this concept of peace. In the Antarctic, it was relatively easy. It had never been militarized. And so it was easier to say, there shall never be nuclear weapons in the Antarctic. The Antarctic shall be a region without military presence for military purposes. Whereas the Arctic has a long-standing history, a strategic history, and nations aren't about to give that up. In particular, Russia, the 75% of the northern fleet originates in the Arctic. So it's a strategic region and it won't change. So the notion of an Antarctic treaty harkens to issues that are beyond the scope of what is possible in the Arctic. However, I would suggest that, the, that what, what is really at issue is not so much whether it's a treaty or not, it's what a treaty would accomplish. Why would you need a treaty? And in effect, the Law of the Sea Convention has in it all of the elements that exist in the Antarctic Treaty, plus many, many more, in a, in a situation that already is in force. So the Law of the Sea Convention is in force. It operates for the entire Arctic Ocean today. And law itself is open to interpretation and application. 
So in effect, the nations of the world could today take the law of the sea convention and interpret it and apply it to achieve exactly the same things that have been achieved for the Antarctic. So I would argue that the law of the sea convention is an entirely appropriate institution. It has the same capacity to achieve what's been possible for the Antarctic. And it's appreciated by all of the Arctic states. If we go back to that one figure, and Alexander may have some additional comments on this because I know this is an area that he clearly works on closely as well. But this figure right here, when the Arctic states said they remain committed to the law of the sea, in effect, they were thinking of how they would use the law of the sea. So they said the law of the sea applies to our continental shelves. We will use the law of the sea to effectively extend our continental shelves under international law, without question. And it was after the Alulasat Declaration, which I think was in May? 2008. Of May of 2008. Within, a, within two weeks of publishing the Alulasat Declaration, I published this paper in Science to show that it was not just perspectives of the sea floor, that in effect, by remaining committed to the law of the sea, the Arctic states also remain committed to the high seas. And so one of the areas of cooperation that Alexander and I have been working on is the notion of the high seas in terms of a, a strategy and a region to build common interests. And so, in, in a sense, your question is a very, there's no simple answer, so that's the reason I keep on sharing information. The, the relationship between the Antarctic Treaty and the Arctic is a very complicated relationship. But if you think of it in terms of what are the objectives, what do you want to accomplish in the Arctic? You'd like to have stable economic uh, environment. You'd like to have economic circumstances that are for the benefit of nations. You'd like to have a, situ a geopolitical system that, that encourages investment because the system itself is stable. <coughs> Well, how do you use existing institutions to do that? And I would argue that the Law of the Sea Convention, created in 1982 from the third con conference on the Law of the Sea, going back to the 1958 conventions, and certainly centuries before that in terms of origins, you know, back to Grotius and even before that, the Law of the Sea Convention is still in its infancy. We're thinking about strategies that cover 70% of the Earth. And as a civilization, we just haven't figured it all out yet. We're on a trajectory. And so part of the, part of the challenge is, is, is recognizing we're just here for moments. And these institutions are going to be here presumably for centuries. And that's the reason we live in a very special generation. Because these institutions, like the law of the sea, that are created during our lifetime, will be here for centuries. So they originated in our lifetime and they will be here for centuries. So you're here at the origin. Imagine, imagine having been present when the Magna Carta was written. And the Magna Carta we know has influenced the development of constitutional law and democracies across eight centuries. And now we're talking about institutions, international institutions. Imagine. You're living at the time in history, in our civilization, when those institutions originated. And if they apply like the Magna Carta did, 800 years from now, institutions like the Law of the Sea will still be relevant. You're here at the time when it was started. That's an enormous opportunity and a huge responsibility. So I believe it's appropriate now to convey our gratitude to Professor Berkman for his very thought-provoking and very enlightening lecture.